Will you explain Romans 11:26? All Israel will be saved. My take on this is the Redeemer coming to Zion and Jerusalem in his second coming, and only those who say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord will be spared to enter the kingdom. Please help me fully understand. Thank you. And so Romans 11.26, by the way, Romans 11.26 is right in the middle of Romans, you know. And Romans is built logically the way Paul thought. Romans chapter 1, he talks about man's fall from the, the height of knowing God face to face in creation down to homosexuality and idolatry. That's the first chapter of Romans. It's the decline and fall of the human race. Mankind started out at the pinnacle. Cain was building cities. That's one generation from creation. He's building cities, not one, more than one. And his children are metal, metal they worked with metal, metallurgists, whatever you call that. You know, they worked with metal. There were herders and there were farmers. There, there was cosmopolitan life with people with various types of jobs in cities right after creation. But people went down to cavemen. You know what the cavemen stuff is? It's the decline and fall of the human race. We didn't ascend from the cave or from the primordial slime up to the caves, up to civilization. We descended from knowing God face to face and being able to name every animal. I mean, the taxonomic ability of Adam to name every creature, and remember, he'd already named one, and after he got done with everything, saying, hey, there's none that corresponds to me. I've gone through every phylum and species and genus and everything, and there's none of me. And God put him to sleep and, and uh, I won't tell that joke. I just thought of something funny, but I won't. <laughs> Adam was the first electrical engineer. He furnished the spare part to make the first loudspeaker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, that's, you could tell I used to be a youth pastor. Okay, uh, I shouldn't do that. I, that's what you do when, when you're trying to get the kids uh, thinking. Okay, look at Romans 11:26. All Israel will be saved as it is written. A deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now my Bible right there in verse 27 has a little A and it, it refers you back to the Old Testament to Isaiah 59. Basically, let's, let's turn back to Zechariah because that's the actual event. Go back with me to Zechariah and to answer uh, what is going on here. It's the actual event when all Israel is saved. And by the way, Romans 1 is about, you know, decline, fall of the human race, and 2 talks about how the oracles of God came through the Jews, and because of that, chapter 3, we're all sinners, and Abraham was a prototype of faith, and justification is by faith in chapter 5. Sanctification starts in 6, and everybody slugs through it in chapter 7, but the triumph is chapter 8, life in the Spirit. Then we come to the hard part of Romans. In fact, the reformers basically stopped in 5, 6, and 7. Basically, they stopped in 5. Because they didn't know what to do with 9, 10, and 11. Because Romans 9, 10, and 11 says that us today, the church, are grafted into the root that is the olive tree of Israel. That, that God used Israel to be his oracles. Every book of the Bible was written either by a Jew or under the direct supervision of a Jew. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar wrote one chapter, and he wasn't a Jew, he was a, a Babylonian, but he was under the auspices of Daniel. Luke was not a Jew, he was a Greek, but he, or he had a Greek father and was raised in, 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 uh, in around it, and he was a, a physician in the Greek culture, but he was under Paul's tutelage. And as a, as, as a writer, they were always under the Jewish tutelage. So all the oracles of God, all the prophets of God, all the word of God came through the Jewish people. So did the Messiah, a Jew, Jesus Christ. And so when we get to Romans 9, 10, 11, God says, I have a big future plan for Israel. But right now they're in unbelief. In fact, it says they have a veil over their faces. Whenever the scriptures are, are taught, they just go like this. They can't see it. And it's true. We just got back last month from Israel. Our guide, who we've had for 15 trips, 15 trips, he's listened to me teach. He said it again. He look, he's an unbeliever. He's a Jew. He went there because he felt he wanted to. He left a, a wealthy home in New Jersey. He was a rock singer and lived in a secular Jewish home. And he went to pick cabbages and pull weeds in kibbutz, kibbutzim, in Israel. Why? He said, I don't know. I just wanted to come here. He's not saved yet. 
You know what he told me? He said, how do you understand the Bible? He says, I've, I've led tours, I've taught from the Bible, but he said, I can't understand it. And I says, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. They're only understood by the Spirit of God coming within. So Israel has the blinders on. But look what's going to happen in Zechariah chapter 12. This is, um, and by the way, what I'm doing right now, uh, and I, I should draw this, I've just crossed the line because there are two main ways of looking at the Scripture. There is the covenant theology uh, they call themselves the covenanters, I don't know how, covenanters, I don't know, the covenant theologians, covenanters. And then there's the dispensational theological view. And basically, when they look at the scriptures, they look at it through two different sets of lenses. Um, covenant the theologians, the covenant theologians are almost 100% um, Calvinists. The other, dispensationalists, are not always, they're not always 100% Calvinists. Basically, the covenant theologians believe that there are two covenants. Now, there is the new, the NCT, the new covenant theology. This is just CT. They call this in abbreviations, and this is uh, DP, dispensational and covenant theology. There is another branch called the new covenant theologians. Uh, if you've heard of John Piper, he's an example of a modified NCT. Piper would be believing in a millennium. Uh, he would also believe that, um, oh, he has, you know, he, he, he differs a little bit from classic covenant theology. Um, but uh, they believe in two covenants, and I don't want to See, that's why I never finish. It just keeps going wider. But they believe in a covenant of works, and that was enforced before the fall, and then they believe in a covenant of grace, and that was from the fall onward. Uh, the dispensationalists believe in seven, uh, and I'm, I'm not a uh, card-carrying, spouting. It's like uh, innocence. I mean, I've never memorized these. Innocence, come on. You know what I mean? What it is, there are seven dispensations, and basically... Yeah, what is it? Conscience. Uh, I know what they are. It's, it's from before the fall. It's from the fall to Babel. It's from, you know, you go like that, and, and you go through seven different ways that God dealt with people, but the same plan of salvation all the way through. And we get to Mount Sinai, and we have law, and then we get to the cross, we have grace, and then at the end we have the millennium. And, and boy, they don't like that. And uh, this, they, they look at it like we have seven different whatevers. And we look at them and we say, whoa, covenant of works isn't even in the Bible, th that wording. And the covenant of grace, the word grace doesn't even show up until Genesis 6. So how, what, when did God make a covenant of grace? You know, and so you know, we look at theirs, they look at ours, and it's just all this stuff. Basically, Covenant theologians, though, are characterized by seeing the Bible allegorically. This is probably the key. Um, and, and here, seeing the Bible, the dispensationalists see it literally. Now, it doesn't mean we don't believe there aren't figurative languages, uh, you know, apocalyptic literature, there's, there, there are figures of speech, but the message... Uh, Basically, an allegorical interpretation, which was popularized by a guy named Augustine. Uh, it was thought up, though, far before St. Augustine in the 5th century by a guy named Origen. He originated it. His name was Origen. He was in the 2nd and 3rd century in Egypt, in Alexandria. So he was very early. Augustine is, is uh, more in the 400s. Uh, 360s to 400s. But basically what they said is, if the Bible says something, it probably means something else. And so if the Bible says, um, I will give to your, your uh, descendants the land from the Euphrates River to the Great Sea down to the, sea of e or the River of Egypt, they think that's what God said to Abraham. And they go, what would that mean? Well, what it means is that uh, Christians are going to um, convert the whole world. And so 
you know, that Christianity is going to sooner or later dominate. It doesn't mean that God literally gave Israel the title deed to, from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean down to the river of Egypt. Because it couldn't mean that. Because in the 5th century, the Jews were exiled all over the world and they weren't even living in Israel and they didn't even like them. You know, they were Christ killers. That's what Jews were. Christ killers. That's what the church fathers thought of them. That's what Martin Luther thought of them. Martin Luther wrote a whole track to the German nobility and told them to kill the Christ killers, kill the Jews. Luther wrote that, Hitler read that, and he did it 500 years later. So, so how could you think that, that Abraham's promise could mean a physical land? So you start allegorizing. And allegorizing means that Scripture doesn't mean what it says, it means something else. And I tell you what it means. And it's really fun. You go to the tabernacle, you read the allegories in the tabernacle, and, and I'm not talking about the, the types of Christ, I'm talking about the spoon. Here's, a, here's an allegorical interpretation of the incense spoon. Here's the bowl of the spoon, here's the handle. And they said that the bowl of the spoon speaks of our capacity of grace, and the handle speaks of how long God is long-suffering with us. And I thought, when I read Exodus about making silver spoons, I think they made silver spoons. I take it literally. But there is always an allegorical meaning that you have to have a key to. And so what you, you find is the key is a code that this means this, this means this, this means this, this means this. So you can't read the Bible and know what it says. So you need someone to interpret for you and you use the allegorical form. And I'm giving you the extreme of covenant theology. The other end over here has its problems too. Uh, dispensationalists can get to the point, we even have some dispensationalists that say that the New Testament doesn't start until Acts chapter 9. That's the conversion of Saul to Paul. And so what they say is that, that the Lord's Supper, sadly, is in Matthew 22. What is that? Old Testament. They also say that, that baptism is also Old Testament. And so that's called hyper-dispensationalism. And there's a lot of others that, that say all kinds of stuff, like the Sermon on the Mount is not for us, it, it's for the Jews. Uh, and you could go through. There's just controversy on both sides. But basically, here's the essence between the two. The church, now this is oversimplifying, but helping you with what we're doing. The church has taken the place of Israel. And so what you do is you say, God's done with Israel, and all the promises that God made to Israel now go to the church. That's covenant theology, and that's why Mr. Piper has become a new covenant theologian, because he believes that promises, after studying the Bible his whole life, he believes that promises made to Israel, many of them can be fulfilled in the millennium. So he has started believing in the millennium. Just to give you an example of modified covenant theologians. Um, over here, we believe that the church is distinct and not equal to Israel. In other words, uh, Israel has a future when the church leaves the world. As in the evangelists to the world, 144,000, as in those who are going to, to be actually living around the Holy Land with a temple, which is what Ezekiel 40 to 48 describes. You talk about an interesting passage to try and allegorize. Ezekiel 40 to 48, the last chapters of Ezekiel, um, say that Israel is literally going to be in the Holy Land celebrating three of the seven feasts from Leviticus. And they're going to have this gigantic temple. And this temple is going to be so big that they're going to invite the whole world to come. And the Lord says, if you don't come through the temple once a year, I won't rain on your crops. Okay, so, so what I am sharing with you now as we go to Zechariah is not the covenant theology view. It's the dispensational 
view of, of a difference between Israel and um, the church. So look what happens in chapter 12 of Zechariah. So it goes Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew. So just back up to the big book before Matthew if you don't know the minor prophets very well. And, and first thing it says is, in verse 10, that the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication will be poured out on them. Now, this group, not the ends, but the covenant theologians would say, now this is future, so that must be the church. But when is the church ever called the house of David in the Bible? Unless you allegorize and have a key over here. It, it just says what it means. God says, in a future day, when the whole world, verse 2 of chapter 12, all the surrounding peoples are sieging and besieging Jerusalem, in that moment, verse 9 says, I'm going to seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. When has God ever destroyed all the nations coming against the Christians? This isn't Jerusalem, the church. This is Jerusalem, the city that God's forever put his name, he's associated his name with. And, and at this climactic moment, I'm going to pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace, and they will look on me whom they pierced. The Jews, that's who they are. The inhabitants, the, the, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, are going to look in that day on me whom they pierced. And you know what's really interesting? If you, if you look, starting in verse 3, I, verse 4, thus says the Lord, I, I in verse 4, verse 6, in that day, I, verse 7, the Lord, and by the way, that's the word, that's the ineffable name of God, his, his covenant name. That is Yahweh, Jehovah. This is, the, this is the big name. You notice it's in all caps if you have one of those kind of Bibles. It talks about, it's not L-O-R-D, uh, but it's L capital O-R-D. That's his, his covenant name. Verse 8, the Lord. Verse 9, still talking I. Verse 10, they'll look on me. When did Jehovah get pierced? On the cross. And the Jews will finally believe that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. And they'll look on him, and just like all of us got saved by the Holy Spirit pouring out his grace, it says, I will pour on them the spirit of grace and supplication, verse 10, as they look on me whom they pierced, and they will mourn. Remember what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7? Godly sorrow works repentance. They sorrow. See, they're saved. See, that's one of the, the distinctions of dispensationalism. Everyone is saved the same way. They're saved by grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. They're saved by faith. Abel offered that sacrifice, never having seen Christ. But he offered a sacrifice because God asked for it, and he trusted in a substitute. So everyone is saved, not by being perfect and then failing and then under grace. But by the way, just to be kind to the, discipline, or the covenant theologians, the covenant theologians acknowledge that under their covenant of grace, there is a covenant that God made with Noah, and there's a covenant God made with Israel at Mount Sinai, and there's the new covenant. So actually, they come up with almost seven subsets under their covenant of grace, but the essence is not that. The essence is that they do not see, it's called replacement theology. Israel has been replaced by the church permanently. And we believe that temporarily the church has taken the forefront in God's plan, but he's returning, and we are not synonymous with Israel. So what is this, all Israel be saved? If you keep reading, by the time you get to chapter 14, uh, they look up and it says that the Lord saves the remnant. And what is that? Those are the Jews that are sovereignly elected. Now, now we're on this side of the page, because remember, Calvinists believe in the five points of Calvinism, and I'm glad no one asked me about that. I'd spent all night on that. But uh, we do know that, that God elects, God chooses. How he does it is in his sovereign plan, but that he does it is clear in the scriptures. God reached down and looked down all over the world and said, I'm, I'm taking Abraham. 
and I'm going to reveal myself to him. I pick him. Now, why did he not pick Terah, his dad? That's the mystery of God. And, and don't spend your time trying to figure out what it doesn't say. As Mark Twain said, it's not what I don't understand in the Bible that bothers me, it's what I do. Okay, so don't worry about what you don't understand. It just focus on what you do. And God's sovereign election, and, and by the way, the, the, one of the biggest problems that Jonathan Edwards and John Calvin have on this side is they can't reconcile the sovereign election of the people of Israel with the church. And they think that, that God sovereignly elected Israel, which means the church. But God has sovereignly elected the people of Israel. And in the very end, Jerusalem, just so we don't spend the whole night on this question, we already did. Um, at Jerusalem will be surrounded by all the armies of the world, and it's the time we call Armageddon, and they're all marching in, and they're destroying the city. Zechariah, if you want to read it sometime, they're raping the women. They are murdering the people. It's just a horrific time. And right when it gets down to the remnant, which the Bible names as a third, so a third of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, he has, he has chosen and they are butchering and killing and raping and pillaging all the armies of the world. But when they cross that line and they get down to that remnant, here comes Christ in the clouds. And he stops it, and they look at him, and it's like they're at a Billy Graham crusade. They come walking down with tears down their face toward him. And they believe and are saved. And he destroys all the surrounding, uh, the word in Hebrew is everybody that is touching them are instantly destroyed and those that remnant by the way Zechariah and Ezekiel tell us become and so does Jesus in Matthew 25 in the sheep and the goats they become with the 144,000 and anybody that survives the tribulation that believed through the message of the angel the two prophets and 144,000 they become the literal physical human beings that cross over from the tribulation into the millennial world of chapter 20 of Revelation and 24% of the Old Testament describes the millennium. It's where the knowledge of the Lord uh, is like the waters of the sea. It's, it's just everywhere on the planet. And, and it's unbelievable that those people, the remnant, the one-third of the inhabitants of Jerusalem that look up and believe, that's Romans eleven twenty six, the 144,000 and all their converts walk in and are the only people to inhabit the millennium. They get the whole world to themselves. And it, it appears, if you read uh, chapter, the, chapter 40 onward of Isaiah, it appears it's quite a nice place to live. There are no poisonous spiders, no poisonous snakes. Um, people don't die. Uh, in fact, if you die at the age of 100 because you're a rebel, they think that something's wrong with you because it's so unusual. So what does Acts or Romans 11:26 mean to answer the question? It's about sovereign election. It means God is going to pick a third of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and at the height of the tribulation, those people are going to be convicted of their sin, drawn by the Holy Spirit, and they're going to believe on Christ. And because two-thirds have already been destroyed, all of them, all believe. Not the whole nation of Israel without wanting to cooperate. They're going to be like Paul. Paul said this, his testimony. Paul was riding a horse to Damascus, was knocked on the ground, and Jesus looked at him and blinded him with his glory. But Jesus didn't force Paul to become a Christian. You know what Paul said? I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision. There is the human response to God's election, to God's choosing and calling and drawing us. There's a human response, the response of 